Well, first of all, I want to say it's obvious that this is a timely topic and not just because of Prince Harry and Meghan's conversation, <laughs> although I'm sure that Dr. Grant will probably touch on that at some point tonight. With over 350 people registered for this evening, we know that this is a really important conversation and that it applies to a large sector of the population. So again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. Um, we would like to thank our sponsors as well, Sequoia Union High School District, Sequoia Healthcare District, Peninsula Healthcare District, and the Parent Venture, without whose partnership this event would not be possible. So a big thank you to all of those folks. I'd like to also tell you that Dr. Grant has been with us before. He recently offered a conversation, a courageous conversation about race and systemic racism and a previous event called Talking With Your Kids About Race that drew more than 750 registrants. And he's also been part of a professional development panel for the Sequoia Union High School District and spoke to more than 200 educators. So he has been a really important part of this year's series on social justice. So thank you, Donald. We could not be more thrilled to have you back with us tonight. A little bit about the format before I tell you about tonight's presenter. We have about 45 minutes of content followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. So if you want to add questions, please do so in the Q&A box. In the chat box, my partner, Bev Hartman, will be putting relevant links as well as at the end of the night, a really short survey. Feel free to talk to one another in chat, talk to us, the panelists, and then questions, please put in the Q&A. We will try to get as, to as many as your questions as possible. So try to keep them brief and general. Okay, so as many questions as we can tonight. Uh, so that is the format. Uh, this event is being video recorded and will be available on our free video library, which has turned out to be a very important resource for parents during COVID-19. We've had over 14,000 video views in the last 10 years, including 10,000 since COVID. So we know that these events really matter to you, parents and family and community members. So again, thank you and glad to have you with us tonight. Our next event is on Friday. We have an English parent forum coming up with Dr. Aran McGinn at noon, giving inspiring, encouraging, constructive feedback. If any of you have a teenager, you know that giving constructive feedback is not that easy. So that's what we're gonna be talking about on Friday. All right, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Grant. Dr. Donald E. Grant began his career as a middle school science teacher in Baltimore, Maryland, after graduating from Hampton University with a BS in biology. He holds a doctorate in clinical psychology and serves in two executive director roles, one with his consulting firm, Mindful Training Solutions, and the other at the Center for Community and Social Impact at Pacific Oaks College. He is a national thought leader in race and systemic racism, a social cultural analyst, mental health and mindfulness expert, educator, and social services advocate. He is also an international speaker and workshop facilitator film and TV consultant, and a published author. Dr. Grant's new book, A Moon for Us All, integrates Black history into a family narrative for young readers and their families. His first book, Black Men, Intergenerational Trauma and Behavioral Health, A Noose Across Nations, was published in 2019. Please join me in a really warm welcome for tonight's presenter, Dr. Donald Grant. Donald, take it away. Oh, Donald, you're on mute. And I should know how to work this by now, Charlene. <laughs> uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Good evening, everyone. Um, I believe that someone is saying that the um, translation function is not necessarily working. Um, for those of you who haven't already done it, you want to go to the little globe at the bottom on the right, sand, on the right side next to the record button. Um, and you can hit that globe and it'll allow you to choose Spanish or English. Um, and everybody should choose the language of their choice um, and not just leave it on the default. So if you're looking to hear the English, please go and click English at the little globe. And if you're looking to hear the Spanish translation, uh, please do that. And if there are any concerns, uh, Paul, Bev, and Charlene will work on that on the back end, but I want everybody to know that. So uh, first of all, such a pleasure to be here today to talk about such an important conversation. Um, wonderful to have so many people in the room um, interested 
in having this conversation um, and learning about it. As Charlene stated, uh, we'll be spending about 40, 45 minutes of um, kind of presentation and then moving into an opportunity for you to ask questions. And um, we won't necessarily have to be, be able to have like a dialogue between all of us, but I'm hoping um, that the chat function works well for you guys to engage um, and really get some of your needs met. Um, you know. Today is gonna to be, for some of us on this call, is gonna be a tough conversation that we tussle with um, and we'll be putting things in place to uh, support that. And so um, parenting from an anti-racist lens, learning to unlearn, I'm uh, Donald Grant, as was stated. Um, and I want you to know that I tussled over the original topic that I tendered because it was um, entitled Becoming um, an Anti-Racist Parent. And I thought about that and I said, well, you can't become an anti-racist parent unless you become an anti-racist person. And I thought it was important to make that distinction. And therefore I, I, I juggled the title a little bit um, to talk about parenting from an, parenting from an anti-racist lens because moving towards this space is a developmental process. And we don't necessarily have the time to wait um, for people to move all the way through that continuum before they begin parenting from an anti-racist lens. So my hope um, is that you take the opportunity to um, give yourself some grace, um, take some tools from this, and go in a parallel process as you do your own unpacking and unlearning. Um, take that opportunity to engage some of those things with your children as well. Um, I'm Donald Grant. I am trained as a clinical psychologist. I call myself um, a psychologist in recovery. I no longer practice, uh, but I've been doing psychological training for many, many years. I'm an equity, diversity, and inclusion certified practitioner and a social justice advocate who uh, continues to do a lot of work in that area. Um, my business is called Mindful Training Solutions and mindfulness is a really, really important construct. And I want you guys to work on practicing a little mindfulness as we move through the conversation today. Um, and what mindfulness means is listening to yourself without judging your experience and just saying, wow, um, I had that thought and I can't believe I had that thought. Um, well, the fact of the matter is, is that we did have the thought that we had, and when we run away from it, which is what mindlessness is, um, we don't give ourselves an opportunity to learn, grow, and stretch. And so as a result, um, I'd love for you guys to engage in some mindfulness practices as we move through this, uh, paying attention to your experience and not judging yourself, um, allowing yourself space to feel what you feel. So. First stage in this is kind of getting on the same page. And it's important to note um, that, you know, we can all be on the exact same page, even though we all may have a very different story. And that's where I wanted to start here to kind of level set, um, just to say that there'll be things that you hear today that either resonate with you and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad um, that somebody is finally saying that out loud, or there'll be other things where you say, well, that's not my experience. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, I can't believe that to be true. And I want us to kind of think about it from a different lens and figure out how we can um, work to see somebody else's position, even if it is not our own. So today, we're going to look at five not so easy steps um, to gaining this ideology, to gaining this lens. And um, please excuse me, we were just literally talking about allergies, um, and mine have been horrible all day. Um, and so, um, these are the five foci that we're going to run through today. And again, guys, um, we're talking 45 minutes to an hour of presentation. And so please know that you are not going to leave here as an expert in this work. You are not going to leave here moving really past, far past where you arrived. But what you will get is a roadmap to begin digging in to what you've experienced and what you've been exposed to and an opportunity um, to take some of those next steps. And so um, learning common language is what, where we will start. We will then go into talking about unlearning um, historical revisionism and negationism. Uh, we will then move on to focusing on the construct of equity over equality. Um, we will then talk about practicing brave behaviors and tough conversations. And then we'll be able to end with seeking, um, seeking, seeking decolonized data and being able to look at that and talk about what that is. Um, 
the ways that we'll do that, the ways that we'll dig into this work is that I've kind of clarified five domains that were important as it relates to this construct of anti-Black racism and the business continuity model that I'll talk to you about. Um, and we're gonna look at this intergenerational domestic terrorism, um, the intergenerational construct of white identity, um, government systems, media, um, and one very specific area of child welfare, because that is a way in which um, structural racism operationalizes itself in so many spaces. So here we are. We're going to oh, start with common language. Oh, I'm sorry. I was trying to uh, it's okay, channel. Trini. I apologize. Thank no, you so Trini, much. No, Trini, don't, don't apologize. Let's get it right, because uh, this is a conversation about being anti-racist, right? And so we want to make sure that those who are here who are Spanish speakers get their access. And so please don't hesitate to do what we need to do to get that right. Yeah, Trini, if, you're, if you can go to Spanish, it looks like you might be working. Uh, I did try that, and I am literally clicked on a Spanish channel, but unfortunately, it's taking me to your channel. Oh, okay, we're going to keep working on the back. Okay. Sorry. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you. Thank you, Trini. Thank you, Charlene. Um, and so we know that words are important. And a lot of times, all these words tend to be aggregated together. And a lot of people don't pay attention um, to how they are different. Um, I'm getting my phone, Charlene, so I can pay attention to my time. Um, we don't oftentimes pay attention to how they're different. And for me, as we level set in this conversation, it's really valuable to understand how to unpack these things because many of us are using them in ways that are not applicable. Um, and so first is this construct of a stereotype. A stereotype is an internal thought um, that is created and curated as a result of all this different information that we get from all these different areas of the world. And we create stereotypes because our brains um, neurologically work in a framework that says, we will utilize the least amount of energy, cognitive energy to solve a problem. And those are called heuristics. Those are mental shortcuts that we utilize in order to solve problems and they create boxes. Um, and those boxes can be very important because we don't always have time to discern uh, between what the opposite of a heuristic would be and that's an algorithm. Um, and so think about for now, like we, many of us haven't been to our uh, local gyms in years. And if you were, if I were to go over here in my office and grab my gym bag and pull out my combination lock that I haven't used in over a year, I wouldn't know what the combination was. An algorithm determines that there's only one way to get the exact answer under any circumstances. And for a combination lock, it would literally be to go through every single possible combination, 001, 002, 003, 111, 112. The reason we don't use algorithms is because they're inconvenient. How long would it take you to do that? As a result, we use heuristics. Heuristics create boxes, and these boxes help to drive us through the world. Now, a combination lock doesn't have feelings. My lock won't be mad if I just went to CVS or Target and got a new lock. Its feelings wouldn't be hurt. It'll be just fine. It'll probably be excited to be recycled into something even greater than a combination lock. I don't know, uh, but it'd be fine. The problem is, is that these stereotypes also apply to human beings, as you know. Um, and so when these internal thoughts that are generally, um, genuinely, excuse me, a part of the way our brain functions, when they become feelings, that's when they become prejudice. And prejudice is an internal feeling that is created by that thought of the stereotype. And prejudice leads to discrimination which is the external behavior. And so the stereotype turns itself into an experience, a feeling. And that feeling makes it such that we behave in certain ways. Um, for instance, my son has a prejudice against squash. I can grill it. I can put it in the air fryer. I can do anything with it. He's not touching it. Again, like the combination lock his behaviors towards squash don't negatively impact him. And it works in a way such that nobody's hurt. 
when I first moved to Los Angeles, I lived in a community that was largely older group of people and largely Jewish. And I would jog at night. This was um, about 18 years ago. Um, and it was right by the Grove, for those of you who are familiar with the LA landscape, with the Southern California, Los Angeles landscape. When I would go jogging at night, I would experience an injury each and every night. Well, I didn't jog every night. The nights that I did jog, I would experience an injury every single time because what would happen was I would watch older Jewish community members cross the street before as I approached, um, clearly in jogging clothes, so on and so forth. Um, but I didn't get to wear a hat that kind of had a neon sign that said, no, I'm not dangerous, I'm Dr. Greg. As a result, I experienced discrimination as a result based on the stereotypes that exist about me. Right now, we're seeing a huge um, amount of anti-Asian American violence and stereotyping and discrimination um, and racism and xenophobia, quite frankly. Um, and we can talk about the stereotype thread that led and leads to what we see today. There's some historical factors that I'll key us into later about that current situation that's really important. Now, when we take this behavior of discrimination and drop it into a bucket or a container of power, it then becomes the ism. Whether it's sexism or racism or classism, that becomes the ism. Now, as a DEI expert, as a diversity expert over years, I would oftentimes help have people tell me, oh, racism doesn't require power. The dictionary says, and so recently we see that the dictionary has decided to decolonize its definition. And when you hear me use the word decolonize, I'm explaining that as a result of the concept whereby so much of our language, so much of what is determined as normal is coming from a very colonized lens to maintain a particular narrative and you see this illustrated here in the Merriam-Webster's uh, recent article. I think this was July uh, of 2020, <clears throat> excuse me. Editors added that although the dictionary aims to reflect the real world word usage, the real usage of a word rather than any particular viewpoint, we have concluded that omitting any mention of systemic aspects of racism promotes a certain viewpoint in itself. It also does a disservice to readers of all races. Those of us who have been doing diversity work and research for many years have always known that racism requires a component of power in order to happen. Now, this leads us to two really important questions. One, is there ever a space where you have a positive stereotype? And two, can people of color be racist towards white people in America? Two very important questions. Um, the answer to both of them are no. Now, remember, we started off earlier with talking about mindfulness, and many of you um, just experienced a moment of dysregulation. Um, I want you to pay attention to that, because if you don't, you'll be challenged to consume the remainder of what we're saying. Um, so understand that even the definition switching here in the dictionary is dysregulating for people. But the truth of the matter is, is that this particular definition from this particular lens, which is incorporated across most of America, has been dangerous for many people. When we talk about stereotypes and we talk about racism, I like to take a little hip hop history tour to help people understand why it is that there are never a such, never such things as positive stereotypes and that there are never there's never a way um, in America based on definition uh, for people of color to be racist against white people. When we look at stereotypes, we have lots of stereotypes about say Asian Americans being the model minority and being smart. But what research shows us is that as a result of that stereotype, Asian American college students are not receiving those who have learning disabilities don't know that they have a learning disability until they get to college, when they've met with the college counselor. When I was in graduate school, I did um, work with um, children with pervasive developmental disorders. 
um, all different races and ethnicities. And what research showed us and what I saw in my real experience was that Asian American children were being diagnosed with autism at maybe five or six years old. Um, white children on average are being diagnosed between one and two, black and brown children, three and four, Asian American children a little bit later. Sociologists have weighted a high degree of responsibility on the model minority stereotype that stops many Asian American families across the diaspora from entering into that space of understanding the mental health needs um, because the proximity is so far. So when we talk about stereotypes, there are no positive stereotypes, but there are stereotypes that have positive attributes. I would trade good at math for the stereotypes that exist about me, but that doesn't make good at math a good stereotype. It's a stereotype with a positive attribution. Um, so now, when we talk about racism, we think about the 1980s when the Beastie Boys, three white Jewish men from New York, um, and I use white Jewish not interchangeably in that space, but because they were identified as white, but culturally they identified themselves as Jewish. Um, they came into the rap industry and um, the rap industry at that time, as you all know, was uh, primarily work, primarily, uh oh, can you guys hear me? My earbuds, as I adjusted them, they just cut off. We can hear you, Donald. You can still hear me? Okay, good, good, good. Maybe they didn't cut off. Uh, sorry about that. Thank you, Charlene. Um, these men experience a set of space where people said, no, this is hip hop music. This is a space for the first time where Black Americans, urban Americans have had the opportunity to share their stories. There is no space for you. People said that was racism. Here's where we need to understand the very nuanced difference is that the Beastie Boys, Vanilla Ice, and Eminem could probably all meet and talk about the discrimination that they experienced in the rap industry. But what we know to be true is that all of these men would have had access to a record deal and a career in music, regardless of the ways that the Black individuals in hip hop treated them. When we look at the nature of racism, it requires a subjugation as a part of a business continuity system of oppression that if an individual doesn't hold power, they're unable to perpetuate that against other individuals. So in the same way that women can't be sexist against men, the group in power can experience loads of discrimination. I could go to Nordstrom right now and try to get a job at a makeup counter and say, I'm an esthetician and I wanna do this work, I'm passionate about it. And the women at the makeup counter could say, no, we don't hire men to do this work. You're not welcome here. Unfortunately, man, that's not sexism. As much as we would like to disperse the responsibility of our violence towards women by saying women can be sexist against us, it's just not possible because as a man, I would be able to carve out a career in that industry if I wanted to, regardless of what those women said to me at that makeup counter. And it's important to note that reverse racism is not a thing. We have to start on this road to anti-racism by understanding that just because one went to Compton to get ribs and they felt like the red carpet wasn't rolled out to them because of the color of their skin, that's certainly race-based discrimination, but it is not re reverse racism because that's not a thing. As we talk about language, it's also important to understand who's impacted by structural racism. And we need to understand that every single group on this land is impacted by racism every group will talk about how groups of color and white people are impacted by racism. Another important term that's important to know is this concept of cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is a mental conflict that occurs when you have these two competing thoughts running together. And these two competing thoughts create tension in our heads. Um, one of the big studies on cognitive dissonance was the research on smokers. Um, they brought hundreds of smokers together and all these individuals smoke more than two packs of cigarettes a day, which by anybody's estimation is a heavy smoker. 
And when we looked at these individuals, we asked them, not we because I didn't participate in the research, um, but they were asked to take a survey as it relates to their knowledge about carcinogenic connections to smoking. How does smoking connect to cancer? Well, after that, they divided the group up and said, based on the survey, these individuals know a lot about cancer and smoking. And based on that same survey, these individuals don't know a lot about cancer and smoking. Then they asked them to self-identify. They asked them to say, do you consider yourself a heavy smoker or a light smoker? Now, what I didn't say about cognitive dissonance is that when that tension builds, there's only two ways to resolve it. You either change the truth or you change your behaviors. Now, we're saying that we're building cognitive dissonance in this study by bringing people who engage in a behavior that contributes to fatalities and we're forcing them to reckon with that thought at the same time. I smoke and I know a lot about cancer and smoking. Now, that creates dissonance because those, those two things have a tough time living in the same brain at the same time. So we're saying that that tension will be dismantled when that individual either changes the truth or changes their behavior. And so when we think about group A who had a lot of information about smoking and cancer, do you believe, how do you believe, excuse me, they identified? Did they identify as a heavy smoker or did they identify as a light smoker? I know I can't hear you, but just say it out loud in your rooms, act like I can hear you. Yes, that's right, Jessica. Susan, exactly. Robert, perfect. Those are some common names that somebody's name might have been on the line out of the 176 people. Um, and so some those of you who decided that the individuals who had a lot of information about smoking and cancer self-identified as a light smoker, you're exactly right. They changed the truth when they were asked to self-identify. And again, the metric said that these individuals smoked at least two packs of cigarettes a day. Heavy smoker by anybody's estimation. They self-identify though as a light smoker because those are the only two ways cognitive dissonance is resolved. When we look at the history of enslavement on this land, cognitive dissonance played one of the most critical roles and what we see today in the relationship between and amongst people of color and white people. Now, again, I want you to pay attention to the tension that you're feeling. It's not often that people are being honest about talking about the isms in this systemic way, meaning that when we talk about sexism, sexism is violence perpetuated from men towards women be they cisgender women, be they transgender women. Sexism is violence perpetuated from men to women, period. Racism is violence perpetuated from white people to people of color. That is not saying that all white people are racist, but it's time that we stop skirting around the issue because we have been giving insulin to a problem that requires chemo. And until we begin talking about it like this, we will never work this out. So the reason why cognitive dissonance is important in this particular instance is because you had plantation owners who went to church every Sunday, who took care of their families, who loved their children, loved their wives, yet they were able to chop off a man's foot for running away from his plantation yet they were able to make it such that the whip broke open the skin of this man's back so consistently that his wounds healed in this way. When you think about what I just explained about cognitive dissonance, you realize that those two things can't exist at the same time. It's impossible for you to consider yourself a God-fearing human being who loves his family and takes care of his children and go out, rape, and pillage the people who you own, beat them to near death. So what do you think they did? Again, 
Only two ways to resolve dissonance, you change your behavior or you change the truth. Those who decided to change their behavior, many of them became abolitionists when they could no longer tussle with the dissonance associated with the treatment of the enslaved and their concept of self. Now, what about those who didn't change their behavior? What did they do? Again, one option, change the truth. So what truth did they change? They certainly didn't say, now I don't love God, now I don't take care of my family, now I don't love my children. No, the truth that was changed was to make it such that black people were inhuman, not human, subhuman, legislated as three fifths of a person. Until we talk about the fact that cognitive dissonance created a mental framework where white people were taught intergenerationally, both explicitly and implicitly that black people were less than human leads us to today where we can see a former police officer by the name of Derek Chauvin spend over eight minutes with his knee on a man's neck. You can only do that if you see somebody as less than human. Give you guys a moment. So I know some of that can be challenging to tolerate. The next step to this is how we've curated a story surrounding these events as though they didn't happen as they really did happen. Historical revisionism and negationism have been two really big tools inside the maintenance of white supremacy in America that stops white people from being able to become anti-racist people, which will allow them to become anti-racist parents. You must unlearn what you have learned. Historical revisionism, and you'll see here on the left-hand column of this, on the left side of this slide, um, historical revisionism, revisionism is this construct whereby, whereby we've recreated history across the years to tell a story that's not accurate, to tell a story that's just not true. Many of us would be flabbergasted if our children came home with a book like this. But there are those of us who, are, who feel really empowered when our children do in fact learn this. If you are not becoming comfortable with your own stuff, how do you think you're gonna react when your children get decolonized story about, stories about the world? When we talk about becoming an anti-racist parent, we're talking about becoming an anti-racist person. It's impossible to engage those practices if you don't do the work yourself. Many of us remember Blockbuster, and I only have about 12 minutes left, I think. Many of us remember Blockbuster, and Blockbuster um, thought that we'd be traveling through their aisles for the rest of our lives, and we can remember walking through, picking out movies, and taking them home, and never watching them. Well, Redbox came to Blockbuster very early on and said, one day you're going to be able to watch any video from your home, from your couch, from your living room at any time. Blockbuster said, that's never going to happen. As a result, rest in peace, Blockbuster. Blockbuster did not have a business continuity model. They did not go through business continuity planning. They did not do a risk assessment to see what the business impact was to create a strategic plan to test and train and maintain whatever they were looking to do. Blockbuster did not have one, but America did. Again, some of this knowledge and information of unlearning is very challenging. However, this is my area of research. I have a textbook um, published that uh, Charlene mentioned earlier on intergenerational colonialism and Black men uh, looking at how these things have happened, not just in the United States, because by 1860, America had created one of the first global economies that made America the exporter of over 80% of the world's cotton. When emancipation was on the brink, individuals knew that this was gonna be a problem because they were using a free labor system to finance over 80% of this, of this particular product, which was oftentimes referred to and has historically been referred to as white gold. That's the value of it. When I looked at my research based on the number of birth records in Northwest uh, UK, a town called Lancashire, we see that almost 85% of the men who wrote their occupations on the birth records of their children were in some ways connected to the textile industry. 
What that meant was that the end of enslavement would create a huge gap in this 80% market, market monopoly. Nobody was gonna let that go without creating a plan that would fill that gap. Unfortunately, we're still in the middle of that business continuity plan, which maintains a level of oppression over time, intergenerationally from enslavement through these constructs of convict leasing and debt peonage where individuals would be able to go to um, prisons and lease um, prisoners. And you say, well, they were locked up. So obviously they did something wrong, not so. In 1844, we begin to see the outrolling of these, thing called, these things called um, vagrancy laws. Vagrancy law said you could arrest me if I look homeless, if I look like I'm loitering, or if I look unemployed. Well, if I was enslaved last week, who do you think that these laws were targeted at? And then you add that next layer of a business continuity model to the 13th Amendment of the Constitution, and you say there is only one way that you can remain enslaved, and that is if you are charged with a crime. And some of you may be familiar with the fact that the 13th Amendment does, in fact, allow enslavement to still legally exist in America if, in fact, you have been charged with a crime. Hence our prison industrial complex, um, this current layer of this situation. When we talk about these experiences, it's important to note that there were methods utilized to maintain this, and this speaks to the gravity of what we're experiencing today. Many of us have an understanding that when we talk about white supremacy, this is what many of us see. When the fact of the matter is, is that white supremacy is simply the philosophical concept that whiteness is supreme or superior over other groups. When we only think about these pictures as the construct of white supremacy, we again lose sight of the battle that white supremacy is not just this, White supremacy is also the fact that in the state of California, they had to pass the Crown Act, which says that you cannot discriminate against me just because of the way my hair grows out of my head. If you have not looked up the Crown Act, look that up. That is a construct of white supremacy. Lynching and white supremacy has been a long ongoing tool utilized to maintain this concept of my inhumanity. And I'll tell you exactly how it worked. If you look at this picture here to the left, you see small children there. See this little girl? This little girl is currently the, currently the age of a college student's grandmother. Think about it, those of you who have children. You come home from work and you say, hey, honey, grab a juice box. We are going to go and chase down a black dude, set him on fire and hang him. This is what was happening in 1945 and 1955 and 1965. When I explained to you the cognitive dissonance that made me inhuman, there is a business continuity model in America associated with the maintenance of white supremacy that makes it such that these three generations of black men right here have each experienced their own trauma. We have Emmett Till here for grandpa, lynched in 1955, we have James Byrd here in Texas, lynched in 1998, dragged behind a car and a chain. Now we have these young boys who had to experience George Floyd lynched in 2020. When we're talking about structural racism and your role to becoming anti-racist people so you can become anti-racist parents, it's important to see that there is a deliberate effort to maintain a lens of a particular community in order to maintain this historic, maintain this historic space. Centering whiteness. Something that we don't oftentimes talk about is how did European immigrants become white? When European immigrants arrived on this land, they weren't white. They were Italian, they were Jewish, they were Irish, they were Polish, they were Italian. I said Italian already. They were Greek, but they weren't white. Many of us don't ask the question about how white people became white. I would encourage you all to begin looking at the deliberate efforts to create whiteness, to maintain suppression. When many of these Eastern Europeans arrived in the United States in the 1860s and 70s, they were relegated to communities that were largely filled with recently emancipated Black people. In fact, 
the descendants of the colonists didn't care for the immigrants at all. That's why they told them that's where they had to live. They were severely discriminated against. Long story short, when the descendants of the colonists began to see the unions coming together between the immigrants and the black people, they came over and said, hey, Mr. Polish immigrant, if you cut that SKI off the back of your last name, I'll let you enroll your kid in my school. Hey, Mr. Italian immigrant, if you stop cooking all that pungent school, all that pungent food, I'll let you buy a house on my block. Hey, Mr. Irish man, if you change your last name, I'll let you apply for a job at my workplace. And as a result, European immigrants began to throw away bits and pieces of their culture to become white in order to increase proximity away from blackness. When we talk about how this is operationalized inside of our voting and legal structures, it's important to pay attention. And many of us remember looking at the Georgia runoff elections wondering, well, why do we have to talk about this again in January? We just did this in November. Shouldn't the winner win? Georgia is one of 10 states who has a runoff election or a two round system. These are the other states that are included in that. You may recognize some sort of geographic pattern associated with that. I'll allow you to do your own um, geography search on that one. But what we know is that these states, particularly Georgia, begin with what was called a county unit system, which made it such that rural votes outside of urban areas like Atlanta would count for more than just one vote. This ended up being struck down in 1962 by the, the based on the 14th Amendment saying, listen, one person, one vote, that's it. And as a result, they moved to the two party system, the runoff system, which said, okay, we're gonna have two elections because right now we have more than one white candidate and they're splitting the white vote. And every black person is voting for the black candidate. And as a result, the black candidate ends up coming out with a higher percentage of votes and they win. We can't have that. What do we need to do to stop that? Oh, we'll make them run again. Let's let the white people pick their favorite white person and the black person who they pick will run against the favorite white person. This is the first time in Georgia, where this trope of white supremacy didn't work. This is the first time in Georgia that we saw the election of a Jewish man and a black man. What do you see happening in Georgia now? They're working on changing the constitution to make it more difficult for black, brown, and poor people to vote. Now you have to have IDs and you got to do all this stuff. It's never been the case. They've never done this in the last 15 years. And suddenly, given the outcome of this election, now we're shifting that. My goal is to help you all see this business continuity model in the maintenance of oppression so that you know the work, the magnitude of the work required to get there. We're on step five, step three now, understanding the difference between equity and equality. When we understand the difference here, we know that equality is giving everybody the same thing. Equity is giving people what they need. We understand that if we say, well, you got all the same opportunities that everybody else got, we're not honoring the historical context associated with some communities. That's the whole reason why right now you're no longer able to ask how much somebody made when they're going to get another job, how much they made in their previous job because that would just maintain pay inequity for women. If a woman has to disclose her previous salary at every opportunity for a job advancement, that next firm is gonna base their salary on what she previously made, not on what that job is worth. And so we had to put a policy in place that said, okay guys, in order to dismantle structural race, structural sexism, <clears throat> excuse me, we gotta change this rule. And that's what they did. Here's another policy that played out in such a negative way. Um, and it looks like I have one minute. Charlene, is it just one minute left or do I have a couple more before we have to get to questions and answers? Please take a couple more, Donald, you're on a roll. Okay, I'll just take three more minutes and then I'll stop. Um, and so I wanted us to look at this construct 
to give you guys a specific example about how these things exist so that you understand when we're talking equity and equality, it's an important note. In 1944, the GI Bill gave $95 million in social programming um, to over 16 million returning soldiers um, from the war. What we know is that it gave job training, college tuition, home loans, all these sorts of things. Um, and it really kind of propelled and created the modern middle class. What we also know is of those 16 million men who were returning from, from service, these benefits weren't granted to black and brown men. And so where we'll end today, and I have other things that I wanna talk about that hopefully will come out um, through the 15 minutes of questions and answers so that you guys can really take these tools and use the data and use the information to really inform your road forward of unlearning. Um, I wanted to take you through this concept of looking at a story from two different angles based on one's experience or access to the GI Bill. So first we're gonna look at Philip's story really quick. Quickly. Uh, Philip was born in 1947. He had a father who had a high school education in Philadelphia. Um, his dad was white, a veteran. When he returned from war, he was able to use the low interest mortgage provisions and he moved his family from public housing, public segregated house, moved his family from public housing to a segregated suburb with home ownership. As a result, Philip's education, um, they were able to borrow against their home to send Philip to school. Philip was the first in his family to go to school and he completes college debt free. He gets a job, buys a home, and then he inherits his father's home after death. Remember everybody, this was only made possible because Philip's dad got access to the GI Bill. Had Philip's dad not gotten access to the GI Bill, no matter how hard he pulled on his bootstraps, the likelihood of this having happened would have been low. So now let's look at Ray's story. Ray, born same year, same city, dad, same schooling, except dad was black. Dad was unable to access the home loans due to restrictive loan underwriting. He remained in a segregated community, remained in rental property, raised education. The family couldn't afford to send him to college. And so he graduates with a diploma from an under-resourced under segregated high school. He works minimum wage jobs, continues to live in his family home. He has to borrow money to bury his father after his death. So now let's fast forward to Philip's grandchildren. When we look at this next generation, three generations out, what we see is that Philip's grandchildren, Philip gives his children his father's appreciated home. They live in thriving communities. College is paid for with home equity. Phyllis, Philip establishes a trust fund for his grandchildren. This is what we call three generations of accumulated advantage. Let's look at Ray's children. No house to inherit. Ray raises children in disinvested communities, completes college with work study and student loans. Ray has no personal assets to leave his grandchildren. This is what we call three generations of accumulated disadvantage. If we don't pay attention to how to do this work and the nature of the gravity of it, we will never be able to become anti-racist people because we are not understanding the level of work that has gone into the maintenance of this system. Many of you have been convinced that becoming an ally is what we need. We need individuals to become accomplices and co-conspirators. The difference being is that one goes to the march with a sign and the other one is willing to take a risk in order to get this work done. And part of that is saying, we can't continue to have 50% of books published for children be led by white characters. We can't continue to say that in 2018, the percentage of books for children that had animals and trucks as the driving characters made up a larger percentage than all the children of color combined. You don't have to be a mathematician to add up to know that only 23% of the books created in 2018 were led by children of color of all ethnicities and cultures. 4% less than books. This is a part of that centering. I had to create a book for my son so that he could see himself in a book because I was tired of all the books only being about black boys fighting gang violence, trying to get a scholarship to play basketball. 
Thank you so much today, guys. Oops, I hit the wrong button. I meant to hit stop share. Well, Donald, we cannot thank you enough. That was a lot, a lot to absorb. Thank you, Trini. Thank you for being with us. Um, now it's time to take some questions from you, the audience. You've given us lots to think about. Let's see how we can do. I wish I were Oprah, Donald, but I'm going to do the best I can <laughs> as a white woman here. Okay. <laughs> no, well, I don't think it matters. Oprah could be purple. Um, I mean, she has just developed this skill. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's let's try it. Okay. I have some questions that have come in earlier. And anybody with a question, please do type it into the Q&A button and we'll keep going. All right. First off, parent asks, what should we say when we hear inappropriate, that is racist language from a friend or colleague or one of our children's friends? I never know whether I should step in. We got to call it out every time. Remember, our children are watching us. And when we grew up, many of us sat by and watched grandpa or great grandma let things come out of their mouth and we would watch our parents not react to it. They gave us messages and modeled for us how we were supposed to react, react and respond. What we have to do now is build a lexicon. And remember, lexicon is different than vocabulary. Vocabulary are the words you know, your lexicon are the words you use. And we wanna build up a lexicon to be able to engage. And what that means is we practice, practice, practice. If you wanna to go to a friend's house and do some role plays um, with them on talking about this, it would be a wonderful opportunity. You know, Get a bottle of wine with your best friend and practice. What are you going to say when somebody says to you that this somebody says in front of you something inappropriate? How do you do it? That's an example of being an accomplice, right? Being in a space that says, I'm willing to risk social capital to make a change in this area. A man who goes to the women's march with a sign saying, you know, pay equity for women, pay equity for women, that's an ally. A man who goes into his office and says, I know that Charlene is making 10% less than me for the same job, and I'm willing to take a pay cut in order to increase pay equity, that is an accomplice or a co-conspirator. Okay, I like that. That's an active role. So you're suggesting we need to be much more active than simply saying we're an ally. We got to remove, we got to be willing to risk something, Charlene. Okay, okay, fair enough. Good place to start. Um, here's a question from Kate. Any advice on how to impress upon others the importance of being anti-racist? That it's, it's, it's deadly, um, that it's fatal um, to not be. Um, when we talk about the violence associated with racism and um, you know all of the isms really, um, we, we are complicit in the deaths of people when we do not engage in anti-ism work. When men don't engage in work that reduces um, rape culture, we are responsible for violence against women. And so, you know, when we talk about what is the motivation, um, the motivation is saving the lives of people. That's why, um, you know, multicultural spaces are so important. Um, I just spent, you know, a lot of time explaining why my humanity um, is consistently seen as less than. And if you are not in a space to engage with a black family or a brown family, you will default to the lower degree of humanity. You don't know it. You're not walking through the world like, oh, that's an animal, that's an animal, that's an animal. That's not what you're doing. And as a result, we don't pay attention to it. And so what we have to do is say, the world tells me that this person is less than, and I now have to take deliberate efforts to build an empathic framework, to build relationships, to read stories about people who I would have never read stories about before, to feel and know them so that I can convince myself that they too are human because the world has told me that they're not. Even if you don't cognitively believe that, you have to understand the system has been curated to make you behave in that way. So do some deliberate things to break that apart. Movies and films 
have all contributed to this learning that we have to undo. All right, lots of people writing in saying, where can we get more of Donald Grant? Where can we hear more? So we're gonna make sure that they get that, okay? Because we do have some great videos, everybody, already recorded and we promise we'll hear more. This was just such, it was very intense. I won't say it wasn't Donald, but thank you for really putting it all out on the table today. Well, thank you, Charlene. I, I, you know, I, I often, when we have just an hour together, Charlene, my, you know, I say, I'm not serving appetizers. You're not going to get any chocolate drizzle on your cheesecake. We're just going in. Um, because to me, I have an 11 year old black son. And the more people understand how to do this work, it makes it, it makes it, I'm, I'm getting emotional. It makes it son that, so that my son has a better chance of living, literally. I'm not being like, you know, woo 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 about that. I'm literally saying the more people that see his humanity and understand the continuity model that makes you see him as less than, the more people who begin to dismantle that, the safer it is for our communities. All right, so here's a question and I'm gonna rephrase it a little bit. The question is, at what age is it appropriate to start talking to your black child about police brutality? I say, at what age is it appropriate to start talking to any child about police brutality? Yeah, that's a great question. I was looking for my book called The First Hour of Racism, and I don't have it handy right now. The First Hour of Racism is a study um, of preschoolers and when they first begin to act and behave based on race. Um, and so we know that research shows us that at age three and four, children begin to make engagement decisions based on race. And so there is a difference between talking to children about police violence and talking to them about racism. Um, I did an interview on ABC Nightly news that you guys can google about how to talk to children about racism That's um a great it was interview. thank you thank you charlene um and so that if you google abc nightly news talking to kids about racism it should come up but we have to start talking about racism early on because we don't need the first conversation to a child about racism to be about police violence um i did a training at one of the private schools locally here and they were talking about um lgbtq um, um, communities and they had a child in elementary school who was transitioning and they're like we don't know how we can't incorporate transgender into our elementary class and then I told them about you know looking at things like seahorses that transition through across genders through their life cycle that's a way of bringing these things in to conversations. So parents, you guys have to be really creative. You gotta pay attention to your child's developmental stage. I was the Dean of a School of Human Development for many years, and so I understand that framework too. So I can't say, oh, at four years old, you can talk about police violence. Um, you have to look at your kid, what they need, and understand how you have scaffolded them to that moment. If you've never had a conversation about race, you certainly shouldn't start there, but if you've been working working on it for a while. It's really important. So um, listen, um, white parents get this book. I just saw that text come up. This book is a conversation starter. I wrote this book. In fact, the dedication in the book says that this book is dedicated to black people across the diaspora whose families rarely get opportunities to see decolonized stories of themselves. It is also dedicated to non-black allies and accomplices looking to raise anti-racist children. And that's the purpose of this book. And so, um, you know, if you want to learn how to do this, dive into stories about people who look different than you. Read George Takei's um, They Call Us Enemy. Um, to help understand some of the current events happening with anti-Asian anti -Asian American racism. You have to understand, and it's hard to own, it's hard to own that what we see with white supremacy right now is in fact an intergenerational concern that we have to dismantle. And it's white people's responsibility to do it. And I hate to be so blunt about that, but um, I even delayed the publication of my book by two weeks because I had to get this illustration in it. Um, my book was due in Jan on January 6th and I wanted to have a better conversation about white supremacy. And I wanted to have the raid of the Capitol included in this so white people can read a conversation about a black family having it and not have to feel uncomfortable. They can be in their private bedroom saying, wow, 
I didn't know that that's what that conversation would look like. You got to begin looking at stories that are not your own. Decenter whiteness. Decenter whiteness. So I want to honor those of you who just have an hour and you need to go now. We thank you so much for being with us tonight. Donald, do thank you, you have you a so much. for a few more questions? I do. I can stick around for a couple more questions. Okay. I can't. Tell you what, we're going to take we're going to take two more questions and I want to just Emphasize again, thank you everybody who's been with us and stayed with us. This was incredible. And so many people are writing and saying so, Donald. So thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody. I really do appreciate that. Um, and, and I know some of these things are hard to hear. And so I appreciate the fact that I didn't see the numbers going down, 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 down as I was talking. I was like, oh, people are staying and listening. So I appreciate that. Absolutely, absolutely. Now they're maybe cooking dinner, but anyway. Right, yeah, um, I get that. <laughs> Here's a good here's a good practical question. Are there any organizations you would recommend who are doing good work uh, against racism? I mean, th there's so many organizations. And when you look at the scope of racism, you can pick a discipline through which you would like to fight racism. So let's say, um, you know, you're passionate about education. There's lots of programs and um, nonprofit and for-profit organizations that are looking to increase equity um, inside education. I'm partnering with the LA Dodgers Foundation and um, the Inglewood Unified School District. And um, you know, there's this wonderful school down there where they're working on STEAM projects with kids who are black and brown. That is a way to dismantle structural racism when you look at COVID testing right now and you see that black and brown people are disproportionately dying, um, you know, helping with that, that is a way at dismantling structural racism because structural racism and racism are woven in the fabric of our country so heavily, it's easy to identify an opportunity to fight it. Somebody just wrote and said, I just ordered your book for my fifth grader. Thank you. Love that. All right, Donald, here's a, here's a good last question and then we're gonna let you go. As a minority parent, can we say to our kids, we must learn to be anti-racist. How do we create a place for them to be comfortable to talk about it as a minority? As a mi How do we get our children of color, our minority children? I, I think that's the question. It's written as a minority parent, can we say to our kids, we must learn to be anti-racist. So how do we create a place to talk with them about racism as a minority parent? Well, we, we're not trying to convince kids of color to be anti-racist because they're not racist. We can talk to them about equity. We can talk to them about justice. We can talk to them about not discriminating. Um, and so, you know, it's really important that we help kids understand that if you're a child of color, you will experience and be the victim of racism. And as a result, or not even as a result, just in general, you may discriminate and we wanna stop that, right? And so right now we have concerns with the um, engagement between different um, communities of color. Um, we know in some municipalities, Black and Latinx communities are not getting along well. We know that some of the violence against um, Asian Americans has not has been people of have been people of color. And so we do know we have those internal dynamics. And of course, we want to teach parent children, none of that is okay. None of it's okay. And so we do want to have those open dialogues and never, um, you know, let people believe that any type of discrimination is okay. Is there any way to really uh, emphasize to schools how to mm. do more teaching of decolonized history? That's, I know it that's is, a tricky subject. It is critical. And it, it, you know, when we talk about decolonizing a lot of schools, the note that I'd like to make on that first is that a lot of schools only are looking at history and language arts. And they say, oh, well, science and math, they're neutral, they're fine. There's a lot of damage happening in science and math related to bias against women and girls and people of color. So when you're doing your DEI work in school, do not leave science and math out ever. There's a lot of dangerous ground in there. And so when we look at history though, because, um, you know, for instance, just two or three years ago, the state of Texas greenlit a book that called Slavery Immigration. 
um, in the textbook that children were learning from, you talk about revisionist history, that is like to the nth degree of revisionist history. Again, a part of this business continuity model that would allow that book to be signed off by an array of experts who say, yes, I green light this, that's a problem, right? And so we need to be going into our children's classrooms and looking at their textbooks, looking at the books in the classroom. One school I worked with had a book about Harriet Tubman. It was the um, one of the Who I Am series. And there was some part in the book that stated that Harriet Tubman had a happy life up until she was a teenager. Now, there would never be one Black person who would write a story that said, you could be a happy slave up until you were a teenager. And so a lot of people didn't understand why we why the why the group pulled that book out. So that's another example of having first voice books in a classroom. When we're telling stories about indigenous people, we want to work hard to make sure that they're written by indigenous authors. That's one really important way of decolonizing our library. Now that's not to say that me as a black man, I'm going to tell all the same stories as other black guys there's diversity in there but you want to work to do first person voices um there's a statistic about mexican food cookbook cookbooks and it's somewhere around the rate that about 65 to 70 percent of all mexican food cookbooks are published by white chefs that's absurd but it speaks okay. to and it speaks to structural racism in publishing all right that makes perfect sense so Donald, I usually end by asking this last question, which is what gives you hope? Tonight, people like you give me hope because now we all know better and we will do better. But looking at things from today, what gives you hope? It's a tough time. I'm gonna to be tough on this one, Charlene. And um, what gives me hope is that we are finally, again, it's not the first time we've been here. Um, we are finally back in a space where there is accountability for white supremacy, where people are losing jobs, people are losing bonuses, people are being kicked out of their communities for engaging in white supremacy. When I think about what happened to Emmett Till in 1955, those people just went on TV and said what they did and there was no accountability. Here's my concern is that right after emancipation during um, reconstruction, we were at a similar space where you saw black, uh, a black renaissance, if you will, black senators, I mean not senators, black legislators, judges, so on and so forth. Jim Crow was right around the corner because we lost sight. And so I speak about my hope tentatively because I feel like this is the same hope that my great, great, great grandpa may have had in 1865. And then Jim Crow came and made it such that my great grandpa had to move to Buffalo, New York, so he wouldn't get lynched. I'm hopeful because I see accountability. I sit with powerful, wealthy white men heading powerful organizations through my consulting work. And their light bulbs are popping on. I see hope, but I'm tentative because I've seen this narrative before. Well, we are so grateful to you, Dr. Grant, tonight, and to all of you who attended and stayed with us and listened. As always, at the end of the events, I say to you, your homework is to go home and talk to your kids, talk to your friends, talk to your partners, your spouses, your sisters, your brothers. Let them know something you learned tonight. We learned a lot. So Do some Donald, breathing exercises before you go to bed, guys. Like, decompress. Okay. Okay. Decompress. Yeah. Do, do decompress. five minutes of yoga. All right, all good advice from a mindfulness expert and expert in race and racism. Donald, you are the right man at the right time. We just can't- Thank you. We can't say it enough. So again, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Again, everybody, this event will be on videotape. Stay safe, stay well. Donald, if you'll stay on for a few minutes, we'll do a debrief. But again, I wanna say thank you to everybody who was with us tonight. And a big special thank you to our keynote presenter, Dr. Donald Grant. Good night, everybody. Take care.